हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू बाजीराव आई एस एकेडमी द हिंदू न्यूज़ पेपर एनालिसिस सो टुडे आई हैव कम अप विथ फ्यू इम्पॉर्टेंट न्यूज़ आर्टिकल्स वी विल डिस्कस ऑल दोज न्यूज़ आर्टिकल्स वन बाय वन सो बिफोर एक्चुअली डिस्कसिंग द न्यूज़ पेपर एनालिसिस लेट्स ट्राई टू सॉल्व द एस्टडी प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन दैट आई हैव गिवन टू यू द क्वेश्चन वॉज द टर्म ओ एम is very often talked about and it is also very often news is with respect to which of the following so the correct answer for this question is some orbital experiments that are undertaken by the indian space research organization poem 3 is related to the orbital experiments carried out by isro so option d is the correct answer for this question now if you look at the explanation isro it is said that recently achieved a significant milestone significant milestone because the polar satellite launch vehicle orbital experimental module 3 it is called as polar uh, pslv orbital experimental module 3 that is poem 3 so successfully reentering the earth's atmosphere without leaving any debris in the orbit now if it leaves any debris on the orbit or in the orbit now that increases the debris the satellite debris in the orbits around the space around the planet earth now increasing debris around the planet earth is also a cause of concern because they impact the already functioning satellites and they also pose potential threats to the international space center so poem 3 essentially demonstrates india's or isro's technology with respect to reentering into the earth's atmosphere without leaving any debris in the orbit and that is the overall objective of poem 3 so this particular achievement by indian space research organization was done following the polar satellite launch vehicle c58 or it is also called as exposat mission and isro has termed this particular technology demonstration mission as a a very important and crucial milestone so the operation has actually involved converting the final stage of the polar satellite launch vehicle into the poem 3 that is pslv orbital experimental module 3 and then they have deorbited this it from the 65 kilometers to 350 kilometer altitude so the this expedited reentry process and aimed to minimize the risks which are being associated with the accidental breakups poem 3 actually carried out nine experimental pilots and it has facilitated technology demonstrations and scientific experiments in the space and this is the overall objective of this particular poem 3 now the next practice question for today is consider the following nations egypt lebanon jordan and iran how many of the above nations share borders with israel so please understand israel is a very important issue nowadays because of the hamas and israel conflict so therefore upsc's favorite topic is middle east so every year you can expect questions from middle east for example upsc asks about the levant so that is located in uh, east of the mediterranean sea and upsc also very often asks about the israel gaza so west bank so all those things so therefore you have to be very careful because upsc earlier also asked about the golan heights in this context since israel is very often in news middle east is also very often in news you have to specifically focus on middle east so identify the countries which actually shares its borders with israel okay so please answer the question in the comment section and correct answer i will give you in the tomorrow's class now let's try to understand few important news articles so the first important news article is with respect to the aadhar based payment system so recently the government has decided to implement aadhar based payment system okay aadhar based payment system for making payments in the mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee scheme however the workers 
and the activists have strongly opposed government implementing the aadhar based payment system because in rural areas the workers have been facing a lot of issues because aadhar based payment system must require aadhar and apart from that it is also requires some technology while receiving payments to these beneficiaries so because of all those complexities which are being involved in aadhar based payment system workers and worker rights activists very often opposed implementation of aadhar based payment system for the manrega now in this context we will understand how aadhar based payment system would actually impact the workers and their rights how it deprives their income and at the same time we will also understand certain shortcomings and lacunas in implementing the aadhar based payment system without actually upgrading the existing infrastructure now when i say the existing infrastructure in rural areas we need to talk about digital divide is a challenge digital divide is a challenge the second most important challenge is internet connectivity in rural areas internet connectivity in rural areas and people biometric data is lacking so all these factors makes the workers rights is being compromised now in this context what the authors have been saying in this context we'll understand the aadhar based payment system and its implications for the implementation of Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Program so this has sparked a critical attention or criticism due to various challenges and issues that are being involved in the implementation of this aadhar based payment system right so now understand what exactly is the aadhar based payment system now when i say aadhar based payment system the worker not requires his account number his ifsc code so he does not require to maintain all these details he just need to open a bank account he should have a functional bank account now in the aadhar based payment system he should have a functional bank account first and apart from the functional bank account he should also have aadhar he should also have aadhar and this aadhar must be linked with the functional bank account so through the aadhar number the eligible beneficiaries money would be directly credited into his bank account so that is the aadhar based payment system there is no doubt that aadhar based payment system has been making payments further simpler so it has been simplifying the payments to the worker or to the eligible beneficiaries under the direct benefit transfer however it has a several challenges that we will discuss in this lecture okay so first we will understand the challenges in the implementation of this aadhar based payment system first and foremost issue is technological hurdles so it will pose a lot of technological hurdles for example when we talk about the ib uh, this aadhar based payment system and manrega linkages aadhar based payment system and manrega linkages we need to talk about the internet connectivity a reliable internet connectivity is necessary for the aadhar based payment system and secondly print fingerprint recognition problems are also existing because in rural areas if you can see uh, the fingers of a people so uh, they cannot be able to recognize the fingerprints that are present on the fingers of the people okay so fingerprint recognition problems are also very often comes and apart from that disabled individuals are also faces these problems with respect to the technology or having aadhar card and all so all these factors can be considered as technological solutions in the implementation of aadhar based payment scheme firstly second uh, issue that the author has been highlighting here is database management issues so when i say data based uh, database management issues this lack of a strong robust data 
with respect to the workers who have been working in the manrega and the payments that are being done to the eligible beneficiaries by the government now we all know that the government every year in budget has been making significant allocations to the manrega program every year the government has been making significant allocations to the manrega program now why government has been making significant allocations because in rural areas it is major employment provider rural areas major employment provider apart from providing employment for people in those rural areas manrega program is also addressing the rural distress right rural agrarian distress is also being addressed by the mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee program and apart from that it plays instrumental role in providing or ensuring the livelihood security for the populations and apart from that if you can look at data with respect to manrega it is said that two third of the beneficiaries of manrega are actually the women so therefore it will also ensure the empowerment of women by providing them adequate income so manrega has lot of benefits over and above it also arrest the urban migration it also arrest the urban migration of the people so because of all those benefits that are being associated with it the government has been making significant allocations for the manrega program significant allocations for the manrega program every year so even though the government has been making significant allocations there are certain issues for example unrecorded working days and name duplication challenges errors in linking and elimination of names persist so all those issues that they have been facing however recent time the government has deleted around 5.2 crore workers from the database 2022-23 okay so because the government has undertaken the deduplication drive and that deduplication drive is actually aimed at eliminating the ghost beneficiaries eliminating the ghost beneficiaries who are actually benefiting from the manrega program but they are not part of the workforce so as part of the deduplication program the government has deleted around 5.2 crore workers from the database 2223 and ineligibility of 34.8% of job card holders for aadhar based payment system so highlighting the magnitude of this particular issue that has been taking place now apart from that there is a huge dependency on the technology when we talk about the aadhar based payment system for the manrega workers right so because it requires aadhar card it requires an a device a special device and at the same time it also requires training for the individuals who have been operating that particular device and it requires internet connectivity a reliable internet connectivity so because of that reason a huge dependency on technology is actually the primary characteristic feature of aadhar based payment system and that is a concern now so it places the rural workers the aadhar based payment system actually placing the rural workers at the mercy of technology so it all depends on the technology so prioritizing certain technological issues over the employment security now the focus is not on providing employment security this is what the author has been saying the focus is not on providing employment security for the people rather the focus is on implementing or prioritizing the technological solutions by the government neglecting providing employment security so that is where it could be detrimental for the longer implementation of this particular program and apart from that the author has been also suggesting that this approach has been undermining the core objective of the manregas okay so the core objective of manrega is providing livelihood security employing the rural wo uh, rural women providing employment to the rural people and which is to provide uh, you know the the overall objective to provide socio economic security to the rural households through a guaranteed wage employment as i have already told you that manrega provides 100 days of legal guarantee 
of work for every adult household in a rural area who is willing to work so apart from that we should also understand technology versus worker empowerment so the government has been focusing or prioritizing what whether the government prioritizing technology or worker empowerment that is what we need to understand and that is what the author has been suggesting so firstly there is a misconception of the technology's role the role that technology can play okay so the design and deployment of aadhar based payment system has actually positioned technology as the focal point and that has sidelined the welfare of the workers okay so design and development is being prioritized it has given a lot of importance rather than prioritizing the welfare of the workers and that is where this issue actually starts secondly rather than empowering the workers okay so workers are not empowered by the government rather than empowering the workers technology has actually becoming an overbearing element in their lives and overshadowing the employment security also okay so in fact providing employment security is the objective of manrega program however the government has been emphasizing over emphasizing on technology and that has been sidelining or overshadowing the employment security provided by the because see when technology is implemented at a large scale in a society like ours there are number of people who will be excluded from this net who will not be given employment opportunities and rural areas people have been facing rural distress and it is uh, the responsibility of the government to provide employment to those distressed sections but in the name of technology you are excluding the people and you are excluding the distressed individuals and that is where the problem starts and that is where they will remain poor and that is where the children will not be educated they will not get uh, proper health care because they lack the livelihood security and they also lack the income security okay and their living standards would also be poor because in the name of technology you are excluding people you are not providing the employment security for the people who are seeking employment and who are poor and that is where the issue comes and apart from that the ideal objectives of employment guarantee schemes for example when we talk about these employment guarantee schemes manrega actually aims to provide work security and it also aims to alleviate the socio economic distress but it is not to serve as a platform of technological intervention see here we have to understand that technological interventions are necessary in every program because when you bring in more technological interventions that could uh, exclude the ghost beneficiaries and that could also minimize the wasteful usage of resources because resources are very precious financial resources very precious so when you are excluding the ghost beneficiaries through technology so that will be a laudable step so however we need to implement this in a phased manner so that no real beneficiary could be excluded from the net of providing the government benefits so that is what the case of the other in this respect however the other has also suggested some way forward the way forward is a balanced approach is the need of the har so when he says the balanced approach uh technology has the potential to support the socio economic development because technology's role in further enhancing the socio economic development at various levels is actually we have understood this and the author has also agrees to this particular fact however one thing that we need to understand here that technology must not overshadow the core objectives of the employment guarantee scheme so it has certain core objectives and those core objectives must not be overshadowed in the name of technology every eligible beneficiary should be provided with the adequate employment opportunities livelihood securities so that there will be an opportunity to improve his conditions and that will also reduces the rural distress and in fact it is said that manrega is also one of the important instruments in further in enhancing the rural demand 
रूरल डिमांड इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इकोनॉमिक टर्म ओके सो अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट लेसन फ्रॉम दी पास्ट फेल्यूर्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल ड्यूरिंग कोविड नाइन्टीन पैंडमिक देर आर अ लॉट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजिकल इंटरवेंशन हैव बीन अंडरटेकन एंड वॉट लेसन वी हैव लर्न from covid-19 pandemic through these technological interventions is that some technological interventions were failure okay so we have seen the failure of those technological intervention so therefore the importance should be given to prioritize workers workers interests and workers security or employment security and welfare rather than just prioritizing crude technological advancements because you are excluding the people in the name of technology and you are also excluding the really uh, real beneficiaries in the name of technology so that is where the problem actually starts here okay so apart from that the author has also been suggesting few aspects one is he suggesting to align the sustainable development goals okay so manrega must be aligned with all the sustainable development goals because rural employment guarantee schemes significantly contribute for the achievement of all sustainable development goals whether directly or indirectly so for example if i can tell you sustainable development goal number 5 talks about gender equality gender equality now don't you think that two third of rural women have been part of mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee scheme and when they are earning their decision making power in the families would increase so apart from decision making power don't you think that they become uh, you know financially independent financially independent and it is also said that if you educate a man you educate a person if you educate a woman you educate the entire family okay so when women decision making power in the family increases and women financially independent so that helps in achieving sustainable development goal number 5 okay so this is just one example but if we align the manrega with the sustainable development goals then it will help in achieving all the sustainable development goals in one way or the other way directly or indirectly so this is what the author has been suggesting and apart from that states technocentric approach must align with the goals of inclusivity and socio economic empowerment so it is good that state has been coming up with new technologies for eliminating the ghost beneficiaries it has been undertaking the deduplication drives through technology so that is the good thing but it must focus on inclusivity and socio economic empowerment that no eligible beneficiary should be left out from the government scheme benefits and that is what the author has been suggesting or emphasizing on he has been emphasizing on inclusivity and economic empowerment okay so one minute sorry okay so next budgetary allocation considerations also the author has also been talking about the budgetary allocation considerations so when he says the budgetary allocation considerations uh, as as i have already we have already discussed that the union government has been allocating a significant amount of money for the implementation of manrega scheme so substantial budgetary allocations to the manregas should prioritize rectifying the existing technological malafides that technology should not exclude any eligible beneficiary and at the same time it should also ensure efficient delivery of benefits to the all eligible beneficiaries okay so uh, lastly the author has also been suggesting that socio economic security providing socio economic security should be a priority so when he says the socio economic priority we have been seeing that 
or we are living in an era of growing inequalities for example if you can talk about the oxfam report so this particular oxfam report says one percentage of wealthy population have they ha they own around 42 percentage of the national wealth and top 10 percentage of wealthy own around 77 percentage of the national wealth however if you look at bottom 50 percent they own just 2.4 percentage of the total national health so therefore it is said that we are living in an era of growing inequality and even the rural distress also so therefore in this context technology can play a supportive role for the better implementation of these programs however technology should not be the sole idea or sole criteria to implement a scheme like manrega that helps in addressing the rural distress okay so the primary focus should always be on ensuring or providing livelihood security for the workers and apart from that the state must strike a perfect balance between technological advancements and the socio economic welfare of the people okay so this is this should be the larger objective of the government and this is what the author has been emphasizing upon with respect to the implementation of technology in the manrega or aadhar based payment system so the next very important news article is that recently more than 60 or uh, a record of 60 traditional product from different parts of india have got gi tag okay geographical indication tag more than 60 products have got this particular tag now why it is in use it is in use because over 60 products from various regions have received the geographical indication tag okay so making it the largest batch of gi tag ever granted and this is the largest tag that has been ever granted here okay so the geographical indication tag now in this context please understand what exactly is the geographical indication tag so geographical indication tag is actually a sign that is being used on products that have a specific geographical origin and apart from a geographical origin they also possess several qualities or reputation that are due to the uh, or that are due to their origin okay for example imagine a product and that particular product originates from one geographical region and not just originating from one particular geographical region but it also has a quality okay so it has it possesses a unique qualities and it also possesses a unique reputation that are due to that origin for example uh, when we talk about rasagulla gi tag is being provided for the state of west bengal okay so because it has a unique origin and apart from unique origin it possesses a unique qualities because of the origin of the product from that particular place okay so which was the nodal agency to provide gi tag the nodal agency's department for promotion of industry and internal trade under ministry of commerce and industry so this is the nodal agency which provides gi tag so india is actually a member of world trade organization and india has passed a legislation called geographical indication of goods act 1999 okay so geographical indication of goods registration and protection act 1999 with the effect from september 2003 so as per this particular legislation because india is a member of wto and as per this particular legislation a product which has originated from a unique geographical origin and apart from that a unique qualities it consists of because of origin from that particular region it is conferred with the geographical indication tag okay so gis have been defined under article 22 clause 1 of the world trade organization agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property rights or trips mechanism so the tag stands or it valid for 10 years and it can also be renewed after the expiry of its gi tag now what is the purpose of providing gi tag so gi tag eliminates duplication of products duplication of products gi tag actually certifies the brand value and its origin from one particular region so thereby benefiting the original 
origin place of a one particular region or people uh, who manufacture this particular product okay so that is the overall purpose of ga tag which prevent the duplication of these products okay so there are a series of products which are being given the ga tag so first bihu dol from assam so bihu dol is a traditional drum that is being used during the bihu festival we all know that bihu festival is celebrated in a large scale in assam state and apart from that japi so that is actually bamboo headgear worn in rural assam and sarde berry metal craft that is also from assam traditional metal craft producing utensils and artifacts and machine handloom products that is also from assam hand woven textile including shawls and sarees and ashirkandi terracotta craft that is also from assam terracotta pottery and decorative items and followed by that panime panimetaka craft that is brass and co copper utensils adorned with intricate designs bodo dokna traditional attire of bodo women bodo eri silk silk fabric produced from eri silk worn from uh, silk worms known for its soft texture and eco friendly production bodo uh, jogra traditional craft worn by bodo community members bodo gamsa traditional dress of bodo men so most of these ga tags are actually provided to the state of assam bodo torkha bodo saifung a uh, banaras uh, tandi if you want you can pause the video and you can uh, note all these uh, products which are given uh, ga tag recently and apart from that the banaras tabla banaras shehnai and uh, parcha rignai mathabari peda garo textile weaving meghalaya and lirnai pottery meghalaya chubichi that is also from meghalaya okay so these are the gi products that are recently given the gi tag by the ministry of commerce and industry department for promotion of industry and internal trade to promote their original nature and at the same time prevent the duplication of these products thereby benefiting the original manufacturers of these product okay because remember india is a party to the trips agreement okay so this particular trips agreement protects the intellectual rights of different products and individuals now next important news article is with respect to the water crisis the looming water crisis in india okay so water deficit worsens other adverse events for the poor now if you look at the impact of water crisis on different classes of people we can say that water crisis have unintended or you know huge consequences disproportionate consequences especially on the poor people okay so therefore how it impacts the poor people we will understand briefly okay so recent analysis by the central water commission this particular data has revealed that only 23 percentage of holding capacity in south india's reservoirs is actually filled so out of 100% only 23% holding capacity of reservoirs is actually filled and that has been indicating looming water crisis in the future so we all know that bengaluru has been facing a looming water crisis and it is also expected that because of uh, lower levels of waters a lower level of water in reservoirs india would also face severe water crisis now what are the factors which have been contributing for the water crisis in the present context first and foremost we need to understand the impact of el nino events so i hope all of you have a basic idea about the event of el nino right so el nino is all about the differential heating of the eastern pacific ocean and the western pacific ocean so in normal times in eastern pacific ocean it comes under the influence of warm cold water currents okay so it comes under the influence of cold water currents and the western pacific ocean comes under the influence of warm ocean currents okay so that lead to the movement of winds from the high pressure region to the low pressure region thereby experiencing good monsoon over the indian subcontinent 
However, with the El Nino, this particular trend would be reversed. So reversed means that the Eastern Pacific Ocean would now come under the influence of warm ocean currents and it now comes under the cold ocean currents. So this results in a drought like conditions in Indian subcontinent, Indonesia and Australia. Okay, so the current water crisis in South India is actually further exacerbated by the ongoing El Nino event and it is one of the strongest in the recorded history and that is very often associated with severe drought like conditions on the Indian subcontinent. The second reason was El Nino events very often lead to the erratic monsoons and further aggravating the water scarcity. I have explained you the phenomenon of El Nino. So El Nino very often leads to the erratic rainfall and erratic monsoon means water scarcity in different parts of our country because the rainfall would be below average rainfall and that leads to the severe or serious water scarcity. And now we can see escalating the climate change and climate change related impacts also that have been driving factor in water crisis because meteorologists have actually predicted that worsening conditions due to climate change with 2023 being one of the warmest or hottest year on record. So that further increases the water demand. And if you can look at India, so we have been contaminating more and more water resources rather than using them in a wise manner. And at the same time, the agriculture sector is one of the largest user of groundwater. Okay, so that has been creating a lot of water crisis and water stress in India. So since it is the warmest year on record and projections have been further indicating that the temperatures would increase in future and this increases drought conditions and intensifies the water scarcity also. Okay, now after that the upcoming general elections. So the upcoming general elections uh, also have the impact on the water availability and water crisis. So with millions of voters are expected to spend their additional time outdoors during the general election, water demand is likely to rise further, adding pressure to the already strained water resources. Okay, so this was the author's opinion with respect to different factors that have been contributing for the existing water crisis. And apart from that, there are certain challenges which are existing and those challenges have been further compounding these factors. Okay, so they include inadequate preparedness for this water resources. So inadequate preparedness means we have already faced the water crisis in, uh, you know, past also in the past also and improved policies and improved forecasting from the past experiences. But actually there is a gap which is existing between preparedness and implementation of those effective measures or improved policies and that is where the problems are actually coming up. Okay, so there is a gap in preparedness and implementation. So this particular gap has been posing a persistent challenge of water crisis. Secondly, there are certain structural issues that are being identified by the author. So the structural in issues include unplanned urban growth. Now unplanned urban growth resulting in wasteful usage of existing limited precious water resources. And apart from that, over extraction of the agriculture uh, groundwater, particularly by the agriculture and even the industries. So these industries and even agriculture sector have been polluting the existing scarce water resources thereby making the available water resources very limited and they have been contributing for the water stress or water crisis in India. And apart from that, there is also a chance of lower water usage efficiency and higher encroachment on the catchment areas. When the catchment areas are being encroached upon by the people, so what generally happens? So it reduces the level or the capacity of those catchment areas to contribute for the stream, to contribute for the uh, river and at the same time reducing the underground water seepage. Okay, So all these factors have led to the increasing water crisis and followed by that climate change compounding effects. 
climate change compounding effects means climate change further exacerbates the existing water scarcity or water crisis and it will also increases the likelihood of simultaneous crisis such as droughts disease outbreaks and further impacting the socio economic conditions particularly among the marginalized groups now this is how water will have an impact on the marginalized sections of the society so therefore this water crisis have to be adequately prioritized and a careful planning is required in this context we must reduce the gap between preparedness and implementation when we are talking about the water scarcity or water stress and at the same time we need to identify certain industries which are polluting the existing water resources which are contaminating the resources and we must encourage farmers to avoid water guzzling crops and at the same time promote the micro irrigation techniques okay precision irrigation so that helps in efficient usage of existing water resources by all so that we can uh, avoid ourselves from the looming water stress or water crisis and this is what the author has been emphasizing on so the next important news article is with respect to genetic profiling of captive elephants in kerala to begin soon okay so earlier we have discussed that the captive jumbos transfer rules were framed and uh, you know launched by the union government minister of environment forest and climate change now genetic profiling of these jumbos of kerala to begin soon so on my left you can see that there are a lot of uh, you know tiger reserves or elephant reserves sorry elephant reserves across the country so a project elephant was launched by government of india in the year 1992 for the protection and conservation of wild elephants in their natural habitat given here all these are elephant reserves across india okay now we'll try to understand what exactly is the genetic profiling of captive jumbos of kerala okay so genetic profiling of kerala captive elephants to begin and this genetic profiling of captive elephants will help in aid in conservation efforts and at the same time it is coinciding coinciding with the festive season because in kerala you can see a largest number of a large number of animals which are being associated with the temples so when it is associated with the festive season it would become difficult to get the genetic profiling of these elephants done properly so that is a concern and that is being highlighted here now what are the highlights of this genetic profiling initiative and this initiative will be launched by wildlife institute of india and wildlife institute of india will conduct genetic profiling of kerala's 400 captive elephants okay so there are around approximately 400 captive elephants and wildlife india would undertake this initiative to conduct genetic profiling of kerala's 400 captive elephants so the aim is to add elephant details to a national database of conservation purposes and apart from that kerala forest department provided forensic kits for sample collection okay so kerala forest department would be undertaking with the help of wildlife trust of wildlife institute of india now what we'll understand this wildlife institute of india briefly so this is actually an autonomous institution under ministry of environment forest climate change and this wildlife institute of india was established in 1982 and it is located in dehradun uttarakhand and apart from that it also provides training programs academic courses advisory services on wildlife research and management so this is what the wildlife institute of india actually do now what is the genetic profiling or genetic testing so this genetic testing or genetic profiling actually involves analyzing individuals dna for medical purposes okay so individual elephant dna for the purpose of medicine or drug manufacturing drug designing so that helps in conservation of these elephants and it will also identify different genetic variations that are being associated with diseases traits and conditions so it is used for the diagnosis risk assessment treatment planning and personalized health care so all these things would be provided under the genetic testing and genetic profiling and this is the advantage of doing the genetic profiling okay so that's all in this lecture and thank you so much 
सो प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू आर यूट्यूब चैनल एंड ऑल्सो हिट दी लाइक बटन सो प्लीज आंसर द क्वेश्चन इन दी कॉमेंट सेक्शन एंड थैंक यू सो मच